Well, hello and welcome to the old classic car channel and today's brochure review is for the Rochdale Olympic sports car. I have a small leaflet here, it's not so much a brochure but more of a leaflet for the Rochdale and a couple of period road test reprints which uh, all came together so I'm assuming that someone was thinking of buying one of these cars and they, they acquired all these at the same time direct from the Rochdale factory. So I'll just put those to one side for now and have a quick look at this small catalogue for the Olympic. Uh, the Olympic was introduced in 1959 and continued in a couple of guises until 1973 and it was interesting that it was actually a monocoque body shell whereas previous Rochdales such as the GT and the ST had been based on a separate chassis and largely forward running gear. This was a monocoque body with a subframe at the front in which the engine was bolted into. Uh, the Olympic of 1959 was powered mainly by the B-series of the 1.5 litre B-series engine with the twin carburettors, as you might have found in the Riley 1.5. Uh, and then the Series 2, or the Phase 2 Olympic came along uh, of 1963, and they standardised, I believe, on the Ford, the 1500cc Ford engine, the Cortina, or the GT engine. And that's what this particular little leaflet is all about here. So we've got Phase 2 Olympic, various pictures of 205 FDM and VDK 147, the Enthusiasts GT. So let's have a look to see what the news was regarding this particular Rochdale. The Olympic Phase 2. The Olympic is a GT designed and developed for enthusiasts with individual tastes. Popular specifications are quoted but can be varied by arrangement. The same qualities that make it an ideal rally car ensure an excellent fast touring coupe. Uh, of course, with the body being fiberglass, it was quite a lively car. It offers monocoque chassisless construction for rigidity, fiberglass for lightweight, durability, and freedom from corrosion, uh, aerodynamic efficiency for high speed and economical running, compact overall dimensions with a large interior, and ample lug accessible luggage space, excellent handling and comfort with adequate ground clearance ease of assembly and easy maintenance with only two greasing points. And we've got a little bit of history about the Olympic here. The first Olympic was made in 1959 and rigorous testing followed by detailed improvement resulted in a well tried and proven design in spite of the concept being years ahead of its time. This policy will continue ensuring an up-to-date model without the fear of heavy depreciation caused by frequent styling changes. So in other words we won't be changing it very often. Uh, potential customers are most welcome to visit our works and examine current production or arrange a demonstration run by appointment. We, we have no area sales representation, only a policy of direct sales from the works makes the low selling price possible. The merits of the Olympic can perhaps be best judged by careful study of road tests by the leading motor magazines, copies of which are available on request. Uh, and here we have a photo which is a reminder that you couldn't just go and buy a complete running car uh, from the Rochdale motor panels of Littledale Street Mill in Rochdale. It was actually a kit car, effectively. You have to assemble it yourself. A car kit offers tremendous value as no purchase tax is charged when assembled by the home constructor. A normal kit of tools, electric drill, a fair share of common sense, and about 35 hours time are the only requirements. The mechanical components are in large assemblies. The interior of the car is fully trimmed. Clutch and brake pedal assemblies and pipes, wiring loom, all ends labelled. Wipers and lamps are all fitted at the works. The kit photograph below illustrates the ease of assembly. Oils, grease and brake fluids are not supplied. So here we've got a few details of pricing. The Phase 2 Olympic kit in quick build form was £755 at the time of this leaflet. Available extras, the Ford GT engine, 78 brake horsepower, that's an extra £40. Uh, there's also extra cost items, there's such as fresh air heater and demister, laminated windscreen, an extra £5. Polished aluminium bumper capping pieces, a jack, safety belts, lap strap and diagonals, uh, Dunlop SP tyres, wood rim steering wheel, 10% uh, deposit with order and balance on completion. All goods are sold ex-works, cost and responsibility of carriage being borne by the customer. Carriage can be arranged at competitive rates, subject to conditions laid down by the carriers. Um, okay, let's have a look. We've got the specification over here. Fiberglass monocoque construction reinforced with 1 and 3 8 by 14 SWG uh, steel tube roof and windscreen pillar framework and tubular framework to accept front suspension components. 
a two-door GT saloon, wind-down door windows, hinged quarter windows with over-centre catches, boot door with cable-operated interior catch. Uh, I mean, these technically they were a two plus two, but a lot of people didn't bother putting a rear set of seats in because it would have been a bit on the tight side, I think. Body self-coloured, red, British racing green, light blue or ivory. The seat and trim panels in leather cloth, black, red or green. Fully carpeted, including the boots in red, black or black and white, tufted carpets with thick underfelt. And like I say, by this point, they'd standardised on the 1500 engine um, from Ford. Five bearing crank, 59.5 brake horsepower, 4600 RPM. Or you could go and get the GT engine for a whopping 78 brake horsepower, which was quite a rise on the standard engine. Uh, there we go. The GT version with 9 to 1 compression, improved camshaft, a larger diameter inlet valves. Four branch exhaust manifold and a twin choke Weber, 78 brake horsepower at 5,200 RPM for an extra £40. And that sounds like a very worthwhile upgrade. Four speed all synchro gears, again from Ford. Uh, independent transverse wishbones and coil springs, telescopic dampers at the front, anti roll bar and rack and pinion steering. And we've got a rear axle, is a rigid axle located by radius arms, coil springs and telescopic dampers with drum brakes. There were discs on the front. The wheels were 14 inch with Dunlop C41 tyres. The equipment list for the Rochdale Olympic reads as follows. The speedo with trip, electronic rev counter, oil pressure, petrol and water temperature gauges, self cancelling indicator switch, headlamp flasher switch, interior light with door courtesy switches, a reversing lamp, electric windscreen wiper with twin anti-lift blades, windscreen washers and an electric cooling fan. Quick flick over here. There we go. A superb balance of performance with economy, road holding with comfort, speed with reliability, individuality with standard components, and strength with low weight. I remember well, the previous house we used to live at, there was just around the corner, there was a guy, I think he was involved with the Rochdale Club, and he had several Rochdales in his garden at the back, and you could peer over his fence and have a look at them. So let's see. So there we go. There's just a bit more of a description about the body and uh, the body unit and the chassis. Details on how it all fits together, which we probably don't really need to go into here. So let's go and have a look at these two. Now, the two road tests that accompany this leaflet. Um, the first, let's have a look. Well, this one is the Motorsport, which is from the February 1964. And they class the car as an inexpensive 114 miles an hour GT car. Um, obviously I can't read all of this because it's a, it's motorsport. But uh, the styling of the Rochdale is extremely efficient aerodynamically, causing little noise and contributing to the car's performance at speed. So, like I say, this is a motorsport review, so I can't really go copying or reading all of this out. So I'm sure they wouldn't be too happy. But I'm sure we can just have a look at their summary of the car that they tested. The finish of the test car was below that which one would expect from a factory built car and it shows signs of having led a fairly hard life. The self coloured glass fibre body is smooth and generally well finished but one or two blemishes were apparent which would no doubt disappear if cellulosing were carried out. Uh, however it must be remembered that the car has been designed for home assembly and complicated methods of fixing are out of the question. Um, and there we go. Certainly anyone who takes a good deal of trouble in assembling his car can claim to have a British Porsche for the ridiculously cheap price of £735. So with a few reservations they were pretty much in praise of the Rochdale Olympic, the Phase 2. So they seem quite happy. <coughs> 0 to 60, 11.6 seconds, which is certainly quite lively for the day. And a quarter mile of 17.9 seconds. And top speed of 114 miles an hour. And that was that was going some for a little car in the late 1950s that you could build yourself. So I'll pop that there. And then <coughs> we have a road test. This is a reprint from Practical Motorist of June 1963. A fast, economical 2 plus 2 GT car, they think. And again, it's the, the phase 2 that they're looking at. Uh, they start out, nobody could call the Rochdale Olympic phase 2 an ordinary car. For a start it looks different, with a front something like a Porsche and a well streamlined rear end. An unusual feature is an upward opening rear door to facilitate loading. You can just about make that out there. 
I've got a feeling that the early Olympics didn't have this rear opening hatch and this was something introduced on the phase two but I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, under the bonnet it has a 1500cc Ford engine driving through an all synchro four speed Ford gearbox to Riley 1.5 live rear axle with a ratio of 3.7 to 1. And no orthodox chassis. And the body is formed into an all glass fibre hull onto which is bolted a subframe at the front to carry the engine and suspension and the rear suspension all of the parts being mounted via steel plates to the glass fibre. Again there's some performance details here. Uh, let's just have a look here. In the dry the test car developed just perceptible oversteer and on wet roads the back end could be made to break away but this too was easily controlled. Its brakes, 9 inch discs at the front and 8 inch drums at the rear were impressive stopping the car smoothly and in a straight line with only moderate pedal pressures. Uh, reporting on the phase 1 Rochdale which we tested in March 62 we commented that it was a swift sturdy and silent car. These comments also apply to the Phase 2, but with interest. The makers, Rochdale Motor Panels, have, tried, have really tried hard to make this £735 GT model a driver's and a passenger's car, and they have succeeded. So they seem quite happy. I wonder if the person who requested these uh, road test reprints on this little leaf actually went on to buy an Olympic. I don't know. So, that was the uh, Rochdale Olympic Phase 2. Um, I hope that was of interest. Um, it's not a car I've come across very often to be honest. I've always quite liked the look of the earlier GT. I'm not entirely sold on the shape of the, uh, the Olympic but they certainly did sell quite well I believe back in the day. So if you have any comments, if you remember owning one of these or if you own one now it would be quite interesting to hear what you think of them in the comments below. Uh, if you've got any requests for future period brochure reviews please let me know and I'll see what I can do. Um, I've got quite a few brochures still to go and there are still quite a few to look at on the channel already. Um, if you have a look on the channel's homepage you'll see all manner of old car videos on there now. So uh, thanks for watching. I hope this one on the Rochdale Olympic was of interest and yeah I welcome your comments on these particular cars. Thanks for watching.